Hey everyone, Caroline Friday, Neighborhood Bible Study. We're finishing up chapter 9 of the book of Matthew. When we last looked, we saw how Jesus raised up Jairus' daughter, who was 12 years old. Some of the other Gospels tell us she had died. And um, on the way to going to Jairus' house to heal her, the woman with the issue of blood, who she had had a, a bleeding problem for 12 years, and she said within herself, if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she shall be whole. And I believed she knew that scripture from Malachi, that the son of righteousness would arise with healing in his wings and beams. And in the Hebrew, that means he's going to have healing emanating from him, even his clothing, even from his priestly uh, robe and um, shawl. There was a blue tassel that... Um, that hung from the end of that shawl. And I believe that she knew this. She had a revelation of it. And she said within herself, but she believed it. She had faith. And she pressed through the crowd. She ignored all the judgments and perhaps the evil looks and the, and the strong language and rebukes that she may have received and pressed through the crowd, uh, touched his clothing. And just that touch of faith she got exactly what she wanted. She was healed of her plague and made whole. And Jesus recognized her and called her daughter. Now, now that is a beautiful picture, as we discussed last time. That is a beautiful picture of an unfruitful Israel. who And there are 12 tribes of Israel. There are 12 disciples. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. Could not get any relief could not get any doctor to help her, couldn't get the Mosaic Levitical temple system to help her. She was desperate, and she reached out, and just one touch of what Jesus had to offer, she was instantly made whole, healed, declared daughter. Again, picture of the unfruitful Israel, bleeding, sick, cursed, and in one instant, by faith, is restored and made whole. And that is that pic a picture is further revealed. Um, the truth behind that really is further revealed in the resurrection of this twelve-year-old little girl, who happens to be the daughter of the ruler of the synagogue. So we're seeing that Jesus is making some headway with the people who he's trying to reach. The multitudes are following him, and the, the ones who are desperate, but trying to get to the ruler. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees is tougher. It's tougher for the wealthy and the um, those that have everything going on in the world system. They, everything they seem to touch, is is blessed. And so, in their minds, why do they need Jesus? They don't need him. And so, it's harder for him to to get them to understand that they that they do need him. That there's a spiritual reason they need him. And uh, we see that's true with Jarius. He was desperate. His child had died, and there was nothing that anyone could do about it except for Jesus. And he came, and he, you know, Jesus ignored those who laughed him to scorn and mocked him. We're, we are not to shrink back and back down because people laugh at us and point their finger and scorn us. Jesus suffered all of that. He didn't let it stop him. He actually put those people out. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall and seen him kick those people out of the house and tell them to go. Um, and he brought in his inner three disciples. See, he's teaching them faith. <clears throat> and he brought in his inner three disciples, Peter, James, and John. The parents were there. See, he had permission to do this from the parents. And he brought in his disciples, and he showed it was just faith. He used the words that the Heavenly Father gave him. He took her hand and he said, Little girl, rise up. And she rose up and we know that they fed her food. And and, and we talked about how, you know, we're, look, we're looking at the spiritual truth behind all these natural things. We're spiritual people. We're born again. We have to look at the spiritual truth. The spiritual truth is more real than what we see in the natural realm. The natural realm is limited to this a uh, very small period of linear time, but the spiritual truth exists 
past, present, future. It always will be. Truth is truth. And so Jesus is showing us through a natural picture the spiritual truth. He has authority over death. He can raise dead things back to life. And then that dead thing that comes to life is able to be sustained and nourished through through spiritual food. And, and we know, having been born again, the only way we can really understand the spiritual things of God is we do have to be born again as spiritual beings. That we have to put aside our natural fleshly desires and our fleshly limitations if we really want to understand God. We have to put those aside and we have to say, Heavenly Father, help me to see spiritually what you are doing and what you're showing me. Give me the spiritual sustenance that I need to understand what is going on. And, you know, you may not get the answer immediately, but you may. It may take you a little while to get the answer, not because he's holding back, because he doesn't love you. It may be that there may be some stubborn um, strongholds in your mind where you insist that, you know, I, I right now I'm thinking of a child playing with a game where you have the wooden puzzle with the holes cut in and you have different shapes and the child is trying to put the shapes into the hole. Well, okay, there can be a round circle hole, right? And they can pick up a triangular piece and they can try with everything they have to fit that triangular piece into that hole. And they can stay there all day long and try and it's never going to fit. What they have to do is they have to put the piece down and they have to open up their mind, so to speak, and they have to consider, okay, well, maybe the triangular piece doesn't work. There's, an, there's something I haven't seen. There's, there's something different. And so the child who's willing to um, not be so stubborn and to put the piece down and reconsider what he thinks is right will then be able to pick up the piece, put the right piece and um, into the puzzle. And I know that's kind of a crude example, but examples like this help me. I know there have been times when even in studying end times prophecy where I've been real stubborn in what I believe because this is what the pastors taught me and people I respect in the body of Christ. And so I was kind of stuck. I kind of had that triangular piece in my hand and I was trying to fit it into, a, into God's round um, frame. And when I finally just said, all right, I'm just going to put all of it down and I'm just going to learn fresh, that's when the revelation started coming and I started seeing things that were plainly in the Word. And, um, and it just, things became more simple and, and more understandable to me. Um, and, and so that, th this is what Jesus is constantly showing the disciples and, and the Sadducees and Pharisees and all those of Israel. And he still shows us today, those are who are born again and part of his body. He's showing us spiritual truth. He's showing us what really matters, what's really going on. And if you're willing to put aside your strongholds and your preconceived mindsets, then you will begin to see things that you could not think or imagine. Could anyone imagine a little girl dead, being raised up like that? You know, there are people today who can't imagine that. But there are testimonies. I praise God for the internet. It can be used for bad, but it can also be used for good. It's a great way for people to give their testimony and show their testimony. There have been testimonies of people even today who've been raised from the dead. That amazes me considering the denominational strongholds that so many of us have been raised with. So many of us have been raised that that just is not going to happen in this day and time. That, um, you know, you'd need the um, medical science to come and revive someone. That, that spiritual power won't do the job, that all that passed away with the first century church. Well, see, already we've limited the power of the spiritual realm with our natural mind, with what our natural mind says can be done. Well, that's what these people in Jarius's house, the mockers and the scoffers, they were limited. They were never going to see anyone raised from the dead. Never, ever, ever. And Jarius was not going to see it either as long as he surrounded himself with that doubt and unbelief. Jesus kicked it out 
and Jesus showed them something that they deeply desired, something that they did have faith in, something they believed in. But they had to get all that other yucky doubt and unbelief out of the way and then they were able to see it. And you know, that's happened to me and so many of us. So many of us um, have had to remove ourselves from the yucky doubt and unbelief and the mockers and the scoffers who say, yes, that's in the Bible, but. Yes, I know Jesus said that, but. You know, just get out of my way. I'm sorry. I, I just don't have time to be limited by doubt and unbelief anymore. And so, while I don't want to be mean and, and cruel, at the same time, you know, when you're desperate for an answer, when your child is on the, the bed dead, you don't want mockers and scoffers and unbelievers around you. You want to pick up the phone. If you need somebody to come stand with you, you pick up the phone and you call the person who you know believes in the supernatural power of God. Get those people around you. When things are bad, don't get the mockers and the scoffers and the doubters and the ones who are, are, are crippled by fear. Get the people who believe, the outrageous people who believe. Why not believe for a miracle? Why not? Don't settle for less. Okay, I've gotten off on a tangent a bit, but the point is Jesus has shown spiritual truth that, that there is so much behind the natural realm. There's so much more that the Heavenly Father wants to reveal to them about the kingdom. You know, Evil is out in the world. The more we read the newspaper, the more you look into alternative media, you see all the junk that the devil's doing. I mean, it's just appalling. But for every evil thing Satan's doing, look at what Jesus is doing. Look at the power of the Holy Spirit, truth and grace. What can that do? You know, uh, sickness and disease comes and claims a little girl's life. All right, fine. But what can Jesus do? He can raise the dead things back to life. He can make all things new. He can regenerate and restore that which Satan stole. Now, which kingdom do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a kingdom where you're the slave of evil? Where you're terrified and petrified of what evil is doing in the world? What the demo demonic forces are doing? Or do you want to believe in your Savior? And all the wonderful things that he's done for us and the power and the authority he's given us. Well, of course, everybody's going to say, well, of course, I'm going to believe in Jesus. But when push comes to shove, on the day when you need an answer and you need a miracle, which way are you going to take? And I've told you all my testimony about my when my daughter was sick, I became a little bit of a mocker and a scoffer. I kind of shrunk down and kind of felt sorry for myself. I wasn't getting anywhere with that. And the, the Savior spoke to me and he said, again, I've told you all this, but I'll just say it again. He said, when are you going to rise up and take authority over this thing and believe the way you have been teaching for 10 years in your Bible study? And I just thought, well, yeah, I need to rise up, take authority over this thing and believe like a Bible study teacher ought to believe, right? And that's what I did, and and everything worked out. And, um, and you know, the Lord did reveal to me um, the reasoning behind that disease. And there was a particular kind of medicine that um, my daughter had been taking. And I had gotten a word from the Lord, stop giving her that, stop giving her that. And I thought, oh, there's nothing wrong with this. This has been around for years. Um you know, generations of people have taken that. No, stop giving her that. Well, I just discounted it. I see, I should have listened. I should have listened. And so after this whole event and after her healing came, I heard again, don't give her that ever again. And you know, my daughter, she got a revelation. She said, Mom, she says, I'm never going to take that stuff again. I said, don't take it. It may be fine for other people, but for some reason for you, for your body, for your particular chemical makeup or whatever, don't take it. So, you know, this is just how we walk out the kingdom. We walk the kingdom out in this way. Evil is there. And I don't think we're ever going to have a time where it's going to be totally eradicated. We are to rise above it. He said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. 
we are to operate in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that he died to give us. And we are not to just say, oh, when is he going to rapture us out of here and get us out of this evil? And, and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm just a weak, um, humble, lowly sinner. Mm -mm. No, take authority, rise up and use the power and authority he's given you. And when you see dead things in your life, dead marriage, dead job, you know, go to him and say, I need resurrection power. I need you to show me what I need to do to raise this marriage back up, to raise this job back up, to bring creativity. And maybe there's a new business idea he wants to give you. Maybe he's got a new way he wants you to finance that business idea. You know, I mean, how do, how do ideas come to people? You know, some of us may look out in the world and say, oh, how did that person get that idea? I wish I could be like that. Well, you know what? You got the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, the creator of the universe. Now, He's, he will give you creative power to do all the things he's called you to. This is a mindset, a change, a shift in the way we look at the world. And, you know, just teaching these Bible studies helps me. Even if nobody ever looks at this video but me, I will be helped by it. Because I need to change my thinking about a couple of things in my life. And I need to see not what Satan's doing, not what evil's doing, not what the world's doing. But I need to see what is my Savior doing? What is my Heavenly Father doing? That's where I want to focus. And I think when Paul said, whatever is beautiful and lovely and wonderful, um, think on those things. I think that's what he meant. We are not to be blind to Satan's schemes and dig a hole and stick our head in the sand. No, we are to, to be awake to what Satan's doing. But at the same time, we don't want to be asleep to the power and the authority that Jesus died to give us. I've gotten on a bit of a roll here, but the point is... Jesus has power and authority, and he's giving that power and authority. Get ready to see. He's getting ready to share that power and authority with his disciples. We know he's already given it to us who've been born again. All right, so after he raises that little girl from the dead, he becomes famous throughout all the land. Well, yeah, you would you would think that was the case. The next thing that happens in chapter 9, we're going to end uh, in this next little section. Something very interesting happens. Uh, verse 27, and when Jesus departed hence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man knoweth. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. Now, I've been meditating a lot on this scripture about the blind men. There are two blind men. So after this wonderful raising of the dead, um, and we talked about significance, it was Jairus' daughter, the ruler of Israel. These two blind men follow him. And, you know, I get a picture of uh, they're, they're being quite persistent. They're following him, son of David, so they recognize him. Now, think about it. They're blind. They have not seen with the natural eyes any of these miracles that have happened. They've only heard what has been said to them. What's that a picture of? Us, the Gentile church. We weren't there in, um, in the years 27 A.D. through 30 A.D., following Jesus around like multitudes, watching with our natural eyes these things happen. Everything that we have come to believe, we've heard it with our ears. We've heard it preached. And, um, and, and you know, it's more, uh, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can take this Bible and give it to someone and they can read it and they may not get one thing out of it. But when you hear it being preached, when it comes out of the mouth of a believer who has revelation knowledge, something happens. Faith arises in your heart. And, and all of us who are born again, we can attest to that. There have been some preachers and teachers where they've 
taught something and our hearts just burn within us because we know it's true and revelation knowledge comes and it's so exciting. Well, uh, these blind men, they have only heard what Jesus has done. They are a picture, I believe, of this post-30 AD church who didn't see Jesus in the flesh, but they heard what the disciples had to say. They heard the word, and they're spiritually blind, and they desire to see God. They desire to see. They want the Son of God, the Son of David, the promised Messiah. When they say Son of David, they mean the Messiah, the promised prophetic Messiah, to give them their sight. And when he goes into the house, they follow, so they're persistent. They're following him. And, you know, he's ignoring them a little bit. Some people may have looked at that and wondered what was going on. Why is he not turning around and healing them immediately like he, like he did the woman with the issue of blood? Why is he not stopping in his tracks and dealing with their blindness? He waits till he gets to the house. They come to him and he asks them a very important question, which um, he didn't ask everyone, but he asked these men. And he asked them, do you really believe that I can do this? Do you really believe? And they say, yes, we really believe that you can do this, that you can show us mercy. Let's see, what are they asking for? They say, um, they said, have mercy on us. Have mercy. Do you really believe that I'm able to show you mercy? Yes. And uh, when they said yes, they were healed of their blindness and they were able to see. And he said to them, according to your faith, let it be done to you. According to your faith. Now, this is a very spiritual lesson that he's teaching his disciples and everyone who's there watching. He is putting the pressure back on their faith. We see what he's able to do and what he's willing to do. There's nothing that's holding Jesus back. He's willing and able to even raise the dead back to life. But he's now shifting and putting the pressure, so to speak, or the impetus on the faith of the person, the faith of the blind person who's coming to him. According to your faith, let it be done unto you. Well, you know, I've meditated on that verse a lot, just even this morning. And I thought about my own life. There are some areas in my life where I've had to examine and say, you know what? The reason that this is the way it is, you know, in, in whatever particular area in my life that I'm, I'm looking at and examining, it's according to my faith. What have I believed about this particular issue? According to my faith, that is where the issue lies. If my faith is limited with respect to healing or finances or creativity or the strength of my marriage or the success of my children or restitution of a relationship or or whatever the issue may be, um, if my faith is limited, then the, the manifestation that I experience is limited to that faith. Now, that may sound, sound harsh to some people, but this is a mature response. This is, this is maturity. See, Jesus desires for us to grow in our maturity and to grow in our faith. Remember what he said to the centurion, who said, you don't even need to come to my house, just speak the word and it shall be done. He said, oh, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. That's the faith he wants us to have, the great faith that says, speak the word. Just speak the word and it shall be done. And don't limit what that word is. Let that word be a high and lofty word that goes all the way to the throne of the Heavenly Father. And so here's a spiritual lesson. According to your faith, let it be done to you. And then he directs them to not tell anyone. Now, why would he do that? Um, well, I've thought about that, and I've often thought, well, why would he care? Doesn't Jesus want us to go and share 
what the wonderful things he's done for us? Well, during this time, I believe he had his reasons for not sharing this uh, opening of the eyes because I believe he was not ready for the Pharisees and Sadducees to hear about it and to condemn it. He was not ready for that. There were more things that he needed to do before the time came for him to confront their unbelief. And you know, there can be some miracle signs and wonders that he does in our life. And he may tell us, do not say a word to um, this particular person. Or, and, and you may in your flesh, you want to shout it to the rooftops. You want to put it on Facebook. You want to announce it. And he says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And you may wonder, well, why? Why wouldn't he want me to share this truth? He has his reasons. It may be that the, the people that you're sharing it with, that it will hurt their faith in some way. They're not ready to hear it. They might turn around and declare that it's a work of the devil, which is exactly what the Sadducees and the Pharisees did. And, you know, he is very particular and very careful and very sensitive to, to um, doubters and mockers and scoffers um, trampling on these precious pearls that um, he's told us, don't cast your pearls before swine. Be careful with the precious and wonderful things that Jesus has, has shared with you. We don't want to put them under a bushel and not let our light shine um, before all men. But at the same time, we don't want to cast our pearls before swine. We don't want to um, put things out there when the timing is not right. There's a time and a place for when deep spiritual truth, you know, this is a deep spiritual truth. These men have had something amazing happen to them. Their eyes have been opened. And you know, on the other side of the cross, there are times when our eyes, our spiritual eyes have been opened and we wanted to share. And I've shared too early on, on occasion and I've been hurt by it. And, um, and then there have been times when I've shared and, and, I, and I really hadn't expected to share, but the Holy Spirit said, go ahead and share. An amazing blessing has come from it. Um, in particular, I know there have been times when I've gotten a great revelation and I've shared and immediately the mockers and the scoffers came and my faith was hurt by that. I was knocked back a little bit and it took me some time to strengthen my faith back up. And, um, and so, you know, sometimes when he's telling you not to share, it's for your protection as well. So anyway, um, he tells them not to share, but of course they, they disobey him and um, they share and so people hear about it. The other thing I glean from that is when you go to the Heavenly Father and you say, open my eyes, Heavenly Father, help me to see what is truly going on. And he says to you, okay, are you ready? Do you really, really want to see? And you say, yes, I really, really want to see. Well, there's a responsibility that comes with sight. When you see things that you haven't seen before, and maybe you see things that others don't see, there's a responsibility that comes with that. You have spiritual revelation. You're responsible. There's a higher level of responsibility and obedience that's required of you when you grow in your uh, revelation and your spiritual sight. And, and so all of us uh, who have walked this Christian walk know that. We know that he is maturing us. And as he matures us, with maturity comes responsibility, added responsibility. Okay, so while they're going off, these two blind, they're going off and heading off and they're, they're being told not to tell anyone. Of course, they disobey. Um, a, a dumb man comes, a, a deaf mute, and, um, and he isn't able to speak. Well, let's see. Let's make sure we get that right. He was... Um, it doesn't say he was deaf. Dumb man possessed with a devil. So I'm just going to go with what the Bible says. He couldn't speak. And Jesus cast out the devil and loosened his tongue. And he was able to speak. So now we see those with sight. They didn't have sight before. Now they have sight. And we see those with a still tongue, a tongue that's been tied down by the devil. The tongue is loosed. And now the tongue can speak and glorify God. And, um, and the multitudes marveled at that. Now, on the other side of the cross, all of us who are born again can attest, and our tongue is loosed. So, we're going to stop right there. Um, the last thing we're going to comment on is that after all these wonderful things are taking place, the Pharisees 
say, well, he's just doing all this in the power of the devil. And we know that that is a terrible thing to say, that we are to never call the power of God and attribute that to, to the enemy and what the enemy's doing. So while all these wonderful things are going on, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the mockers and the scoffers are pointing and saying this is the work of the devil. But we know the multitudes didn't believe that way. The multitudes were um, thronging him. And, um, and so Jesus, we're going to see in the next chapter that he's going to send his disciples out to all of Israel to share the good news of the gospel. Um, I know that was a lot today, but meditate on this and um, put all preconceived notions away about what the Heavenly Father can do for you and allow him to expand your faith and to grow your um, revelation of the truth and step out and do the things he's called you to do. Don't be afraid. He'll meet you exactly where you are and give you all the resources you need to advance the kingdom. So be blessed. I'll see you next time.